So welcome to our first collaboration now with the British Chamber of Business in Ghana. Uh, it's great to co-host this webinar and really discuss something, yes, a little bit about COVID, but really life beyond COVID. For the next 90 minutes, we're going to explore uh, how we conduct business in Africa under lockdown and beyond, and really start going into some detail about the rare window of opportunity that the African Free Trade Area Agreement actually presents to us. So we've convened a panel of experts here from across the continent. And I think a great way to start would be to introduce ourselves, cover the agenda, and then jump into the topic. So I think most of you know me, certainly from South Africa, but for our Ghanaian guests, my name's uh, Leon Ayo. I'm the president of the British Chamber of Business in Southern Africa, based in Johannesburg. Uh, I'll introduce, let my colleague Cecilia introduce herself, and then we'll go around the other panelists. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cecilia. Some of you know me already, but to those who don't know me from Ghana, and I see we've even got people joining from the UK and from Kenya um, and other parts of the world too, which is great to see. Uh, my name is Cecilia. I'm the VP for International Networks and Membership for the British Chamber of Business in South Africa. Um, we're very happy to be collaborating with a fellow African Chamber for the first time ever. Um, so interesting how, how lockdown has actually made us um, reach out to each other more. And that's part of what we're going to be exploring today um, in light of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement as well. We've got some great panelists here today, which um, will allow everyone to introduce themselves. But I look forward to an uh, engaging debate today. Thank you, Shall Cecilia. Shall we go to Rutendo? Yeah. We, we have no sound there, Rutendo. Hi, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. I was just trying to grab your guys' attention, so I'm glad it worked, uh, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Rutendo. I'm an associate director at Deloitte, and um, I, my, my primary role at Deloitte is business development, uh, working with multinationals with their strategy across Africa, as well as... Um, uh, I'm part of the faculty for the Deloitte Alchemy School of Management. So quite excited on having this discussion. Huge passion for Africa and the opportunities that are there. Th thanks, Rutendo. And, and to our colleagues in Ghana. Hello, everyone. And um, greetings from Ghana. Um, I am Ajoba Chiyama. I'm the Executive Director of the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce here in Ghana. And I'm very excited to see that we have several participants joining from Ghana and particularly from amongst our membership here. And I have with me Anthony Yamibefi, so I would let him introduce yeah. himself and tell us who he is. So hi everybody, I'm Anthony Yamibefi. I'm the Technical Advisor for multilateral region and bilateral trade, and then basically also providing technical advice on the AFCFT. And for almost, since 2015, I've been the chief trade negotiator for Ghana and the AFCFT. Um, at the Ministry of Ministry Trade, of trade and and Industry. Industry here in Ghana, yes. Ghana, yes. yes, yes. So that's yeah. us from Ghana, and welcome to all our participants from Ghana. We're looking forward yeah, to no, well, deliberations. No, welcome both. And uh, my, my colleague Ima is behind the scenes, our, our kind of head of digital communications. And she'll be running some of the polls and helping the questions and making sure we all stay online. Uh, I suppose before we jump into the African Free Trade Agreement, it's impossible not to notice the lack of social distancing with our Ghanaian colleagues, which is <laughs> great to see. And I think maybe a comment on the first African country coming out of lockdown, maybe spend, you know, before we jump into a brief presentation from Rutendo, tell us a bit about how that transition coming out of lockdown has been for you up in Ghana. Um, yeah, so, you know, we um, transitioned into lockdown quite um, gently because we started with uh, two weeks of um, a ban on um, international travel, and then also a um, ban on public and social gatherings. 
you know, and, 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 and therefore there was a limit to how many people could gather in one place, not more than 25, I believe. And that ran for like two weeks. So I think that would be like seven weeks ago. And then we had three weeks of a partial lockdown in the two biggest cities here in Ghana. And that involved everybody staying at home, except for some businesses that were exempt essential services. And people were allowed to just step out for emergencies and for food. Um, I'm not sure how well that went. However, um, three weeks after that, we had that partial lockdown lifted. So we are in the second week of the lifting of the uh, lockdown. Um, but what we noticed is that not all businesses have reopened. Um, several businesses that closed their doors have chosen to remain closed till the end of April. And notices have been sent out to say that they'll be back in full operations from first, or let's say the first working day of May, because first May is a holiday here. Um, what it is, is that I think for us, the um, hardest hit um, in all of this is probably the hospitality industry. But we've also had um, a silver lining for industries that, you know, have, um, given the fact that there's been a ban on international travel and um, goods and cargo that was transported by um, passenger um, flights um, have not been able to um, come in freely. Um, we've become a little bit more self-reliant, you know, for, for certain things. So we have our garments and textile industry that have risen up to the challenge to produce face masks and also um, other PPEs for the health sector and for the general public, because um, the directive that came with the lifting of the lockdown was that now we must all wear face masks when we step outside of our homes. So you'll find out that Anthony came with his face mask on, but I told him that, well, if you didn't mind, I also don't mind, you can take it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's where we are. Yeah, the, the, the hospitality sector, the hotels, particularly the large ones, have taken a really, really, really big hit, you know. Yeah. Sure. I, I think that that's, that's fascinating, and it's great to see how an African nation can kind of lead the way in trailblaze to show us how to come out of lockdown. It's something that we're struggling with in the UK, and perhaps some of our Scandinavian cousins are navigating better than we are. Uh, the Swiss and the Italians are now kind of opening up. I know the opening of hairdressers is quite a popular topic at, at the moment. Something Rutendo and I don't really have to worry about too much, but I know a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people are quite keen to, to visit that. Perhaps we'll come back to how Ghana's navigating and how the economy's been hit. But let's set the context uh, around what is this African Free Trade Agreement? Because I'll be honest, it's something that uh, at the Chamber we've been increasingly asked about. And it's not something that perhaps is, is, is known to a great extent in South Africa. So perhaps Rutenda, we'll hand over to you. You can take us through an overview of, from a Deloitte perspective and your perspective of the AFTA. And then we'll come on to Anthony to give his, his insights. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, um, Leon. Uh, can you guys see my slide? Yeah, you're on the screen now, Rutendo. yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I think, you know, just, just to start off, I'm not a, uh, just to, to put a big disclaimer out there. I'm not a trade economist. Uh, but one thing I do have is uh, a huge passion for the business development opportunities in Africa. I probably have done business uh, development in one way or the other across industries for over the last sort of 20 years uh, in 20 different African countries. And the reality is that you, you can never become a guru of the continent but always learning. And really, I think before I, I start, I think, you know, one of the things that has come out of this whole pandemic from a global perspective is that uh, historically, based on other crises that have affected the globe, whether it was caused by Enron, finance, the Lehman Brothers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the mindset, or from a global perspective, the mindset has always been, okay, how do we um, protect ourselves or align ourselves or prepare ourselves as a, as globally or different countries in the event that 
um, America sneezes, everybody knows that everybody, uh, when America sneezes, the world catches a flu. And um, we've aligned ourselves to protect ourselves against that. Nobody was prepared for when China sneezed. And uh, China sneezed, and the rest is history. And I think that that highlights the, the challenge that is there, but as well as the uh, how well not prepared we were in terms of what happened. Uh, so looking at the Africa continental free trade area, um, and, and just to highlight again, I think for us in Africa, uh, we are forced to capitalize on this opportunity, not for the sake from a selfish perspective, but with what has happened to with the continental free trade agreement, if we we look at this opportunity or this crisis as an opportunity to actually align ourselves and rely on each other in different countries in terms of resolving the problems going into the future, it'll be a big thing. And I think it's a huge opportunity in terms of going forward once we've overcome the challenges. So the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement came in force in May 2019. So once it was completed, it's said to cover a market of about 1.2 billion, which is the population of Africa, and 3.4 trillion, which sounds as a big number. But from a global perspective, is <clears throat> primarily, I mean, Africa contributes a very small portion of the global um, uh, GDP, but the opportunity on the continent uh, can be seen in terms of the growth of foreign, whether they are African East, East, East countries from Europe or companies from, um, or countries from, from, the, from, from North America or South America. I think it's been highlighted that over the last sort of year or so, there have been 43 new embassies that have been opened up on the African continent, and this highlighting the fact that uh, there's a huge opportunity on this continent and waiting to be capitalized on. Uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement aims to create a single continental market for goods and services and establish continental customs union, enhance competitiveness, and boost economic transformation. The agreement has the potential to raise Africa's low productivity and promote investment and boost inter-Africa trade. Currently, we're looking at about 17%, but if you look at the Asian tigers, their intercontinental trade goes to about 59%. So again, we're coming off a low base, but there's huge opportunity for if once people are trading with each other and leveraging, each other, leveraging off each other's economies, there's huge opportunity. And more importantly, the opportunity of industrialization, which is something that African leaders have been wanting to do for a long time. And I think with what has happened with this pandemic, it's going to force us in terms of accelerating that process. It was initially going to be launched in July 2020 in terms of the agreement and the mechanics of the agreement taking into effect. I was reading a, a, a Daily Maverick article, which uh, mainly the, 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 the Chief Secretariat for the Continental Trade Agreement based obviously in, in Ghana has highlighted that they've moved this out to 1 January. Uh, that's what is put on the table. That's what most likely will happen because with the shutdown of the economies globally, it's going to be difficult to implement this, but it's been moved out to the 1st of January, obviously accommodating the delays caused by the pandemic. So what are our key constraints at the moment? Um, well, with the, even before the pandemic happened, well, the key challenge is that uh, with an underdeveloped production capacity in Africa, a lot of imports, and less than exports, and the idea was with the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it will allow us to strengthen our export basket and become stronger from a continental perspective. Infrastructure was weak, and I'll talk about this in terms of the opportunity going forward and how the current pandemic has forced us to, to, to change that and invest and prioritize that, increasing the cost of business and transaction costs. I mean, some, if you look at some of the, uh, the statistics that came out, uh, trading or exporting from South Africa to DRC or from DRC to South Africa uh, was much more expensive uh, than exporting to maybe a European country, which is ludicrous if you look at the physical distance between the two countries. The willingness and abilities of member states to implement commitments, and this highlights in terms of uh, leadership, uh, the realities of the different uh, countries in Africa, the 55 that you have, don't have the same political clout, uh, or sorry, don't have the same economic clout. There are some stronger than the others, and that's not going to change going into the future. But what can change through coordinated leadership is the countries that are strong are uplifting the weaker ones. And I think we've seen that even with, with COVID. I mean, the, the, because of the, 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 the virus does not segregate between rich or poor, 
black or white, at the end of the day, if your, your, your neighbor is sick, the chances of you getting sick are high. So if you can alleviate that by helping provide a solution, then both of you are safe. And that's the reality with the growth through the continental free trade agreement is that we're going to have to leverage off each other's strength as economy for the better of the globe, of the continent. Unequal uh, challenges with the integrated and equal partners, which is highlighted the weaker economies, uh, the fear that the, the, the strong economies like South Africa, Nigeria, will cannibalize the weaker economies and uh, the weaker economies having that potential to cannibalize the, the larger economies. Policy constraints, uh, and I highlight the complexity that is there and the work that has to be done. Private sector buying um, in terms of trust with regards to the private sector and the public sector realize that for this to work, there has to be collaboration and transparency, which is not an easy thing when you're looking at the number of countries and political um, associations on the continent. And then access to information for economic agents uh, is going to be key. Technology is going to play a key role in terms of moving this forward, in terms of communication, in terms of bringing alignment and harmonization of legislation, economic policies, trade policies across the continent. Conflict and security goes without saying a lot of, I uh, think where Africa is at the moment, less conflict than many years ago, but still you've got hotspots all over the continent which have to be bedded down if this is going to work seamlessly. So the next slide here that I've shown is a total matrix, but uh, at the end of the day, what I'm just highlighting is it summarizes the, uh, the complexity of the different trade agreements that are already existing in Africa from North, East, West, and Southern Africa. So on one side, if you can see my mouth, uh, you've got your economic community of West African states. And even in West Africa, there's a complexity of a row of different economic trade agreements that are there. You come to Southern Africa, you've got the SADC and uh, the SACO, different trade agreements that are there. You go to Central Africa. And the reality of all this is that these all want to want all be condensed into one. It's totally impossible in the short term. Uh, and the, continent, the challenge of the continental free trade agreement is bringing the harmonization uh, of most or key or, or the key agreements in this region. I mean, if you look at North Africa, you've also got your, um, your Africa Middle East uh, trade agreements that are there. So the reality is that if this is not going to be simple, but at the end of the day, what is going to be achievable is, achievable is going to say, how do we harmonize and at the end of the day prioritize the areas of trade that are most beneficial and most in need of the people of the continent at this point in time. So before I go into where the opportunities are going forward, uh, I've, I've, I've cloned a, a Ghanaian proverb here that says the left hand washes the right and the right washes the left. In other words, highlighting the fact that uh, for us to be successful as a continent, there's going to be huge interdependency. And that's what COVID has highlighted, that for Africa, or the continental free trade agreement to be successful, there's going to be interdependency amongst the continent and the different states and the people, and more so across the world. I mean, people say that the supply chain is going to be impacted significantly, but I think the world is too interconnected to live, uh, to continue going forward uh, to, as independent states. The reliance on each other globally is underestimated, and this is going to be a big thing uh, going into the future. So my last slide. Sorry. Thanks, Ritendo. As you transition into your last slide, I'm just sh sharing a poll with the audience just to kind of test what the actual, our knowledge is collectively around this free trade agreement. But thanks, Ritendo. Please, please go on. Okay, excellent. So going to the future, post-COVID, from an Africa trade perspective, what does it imply? Firstly, um, it's going to, I mean, the reality right now is that it's food and medicine. If you go to anybody on the street and you ask them what is the priority, food and medicine, uh, you can juxtapose in terms of which comes first. So the, the critical flow of, 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 of trade with regards to um, the priority product around food and, and medicine is going to be critical. And uh, that's what is going to, have to be prioritized in terms of how do we get uh, to the ordinary men on the, on the street, food and medicine in the quickest and most efficient way as possible and something that even when the continental trade, chief trade agreement comes into play, we need to, to incorporate and the planning for that can start now. 
it allows us that, I mean, one of the concerns, I mean, if you went to all the different conferences and the planning sessions prior to COVID-19 around Africa trade, everybody was saying, have we planned enough, have we prepared enough? Uh, the reality now, if it is moved up to the 1st of January, as uh, is what is proposed, then it allows us to, to plan more effectively and efficiently uh, so that we do go live with the trade agreement or with the, with, with the trade uh, framework. Uh, it, it, it will allow us to be a bit more prepared to fight future pandemics. Uh, this, the same goes, um, you know, you, you measure more than once and you cut once. And I think it just allows us to be more efficient and more prepared in terms of from a future perspective. Public health crisis, I mean, um, well, one of the things that is highlighted with, the, with this current pandemic is the shortage that is there in terms of the health facilities in Africa, and that has always been a known fact. But what is also brought to the surface is that there is a dire need for a, an African established African generic medicine industry. And from an industrialization perspective, huge opportunity here. Uh, I know countries like um, Ghana, for example, I mean, they've made huge in, uh, inroads with regards to industrialization. I know in the automotive sector, uh, major investments and decisions have been made there. But I think what you start seeing now is an investment and a prioritization in terms of uh, industrialization in the medicinal area and how we can actually position ourselves to look after the, the growing population in Africa that, uh, that can be subject to this disease. To add on to this, I mean, some of the key statistics that have come out is that uh, southern Sudan uh, had only two ventilators uh, in the Sahel region, which is about four or five countries, they have six ventilators. There are about 10 African countries that do not have any ventilators at all. And if, if everybody global is going to be focusing on building and manufacturing ventilators for themselves, uh, I think as Africa, the reality is to say, how can we establish ourselves to, to be able to manufacture locally, but also contribute to global solutions? Uh, infrastructure. In terms of, uh, it's not just a matter of manufacturing, but getting equipment, uh, getting services to the right people, to the right places, whether it's healthcare, transport, that whole model is going to have to be relooked again and, and, and revamped. And that's one of the things that Continental Fee Trade Agreement has to also prioritize and is prioritizing with regards to, to infrastructure development. Protection is measures such as important trade restrictions, the disrupting value chain and supply chain. I mean, a lot of, I've shown you the complexity of the current trade agreements that are there and the complexity how to navigate around that. The question is, you know, what we prioritize and what we do our way with so that people can be serviced uh, and the economy and the continent can integrate leverage of their strength uh, to, to be global players, not just from a continental perspective. The world, my last point, the World Trade Organization says that the worst case is going to be a 32% decline in world trade. Uh, and again, if Africa is able to look at this and say, okay, how can we reduce that deficit in world trade by industrialization and developing ourselves, and what have we learned from this pandemic? Again, all of these are challenges, but I think Africa, in terms of the population, the skill set, uh, the opportunities that are there, it allows ourselves to reboot and position ourselves like what Ghana has done and say, what are the learnings from this and take it forward? So uh, that's more or less it, Leon. I'm going to hand it back to you. Uh, but at the end of the day, huge opportunity for us going forward as a continent. Ruth Sender, thank you so much for that detailed overview. And indeed, some real points of uh, discussion there. Interestingly, looking at the audience, about 44% of us are not familiar with the free trade agreement. Just half of us have some familiarity with 6% being very familiar. So I think that shows we've got a lot of learning to do. Just moving straight on from that, Ruth Sender, thanks again. Anthony, given your inside experience of putting this together, perhaps you could share your insights and observations. Yes, okay, so thank you. And uh, I actually appreciate uh, the presentation that was made by the gentleman from Deloitte. I think we, um, when you want to comment about the date of starting, uh, there have been a proposal, uh, especially from the first Secretary General who has just been appointed, that uh, the start date should be shifted to 1st January 2021. But before that is done, normally it was the heads of state who agreed on that. So it will, the ministers of trade, that is the Council of Ministers, will have to be also evaluated before they formally recommend it to the heads of state. 
but there are three main technical issues that should be finalized before any trading can commence. The first one is the finalization of the tariff liberalization schedules for trading for goods for the state parties. The second one too is the completion of the remaining 10% rules of origin so that we can get 100% rules of origin to cover goods that will be traded before we can start. And then the third one is also finalization of uh, commitments of specific uh, services. So unfortunately, all the meetings that were scheduled uh, for them to be completed in March and April had to be postponed because of the COVID pandemic. So those are yet to be completed. And sincerely, we need to do that before they can move. So we also subscribe that uh, if we are not able to finalize this by middle of May, then definitely the day should be postponed. And as he said, so that we can look at all these things and put up the appropriate um, technical issues in place before commencement can come, so that nobody will be cheated and it will be fair to trade in Africa. Because as we stand now, if we want to go ahead with the July one, the tariff civilizations have been completed, so you don't even know what to trade with. The second one is that despite that challenge, we should also encourage, so far, only 30 African countries have ratified the agreement. So within this period, we should encourage the remaining 25 to uh, ratify it so that all of them can come on board. And then when we start the commencement, we can come out of appropriate regional value chains that will truly help transform the economy from raw materials to uh, industrial production. Um, what we want to say in the interim is that uh, we should take the COVID-19 as an opportunity for African countries to collaborate or come together instead of just uh, trying to complain or make a lot of uh, uh, the, the challenges that we are facing. So as you said, uh, there is now the need to boost agricultural production, especially food and raw materials. And then for medicines, uh, countries who are, I would say, more or less far advanced, like Ghana, South Africa, and others. We can now collaborate together, produce these generic medicines, and then even vaccines and the appropriate PPEs, you know, so that uh, the deficit in importing these products from maybe Asia and Europe and US to feed the African population, we can do them here to be self-sufficient. And in that process also, it will boost a lot of uh, micro, uh, small and medium enterprises in Africa. So there is quite an opportunity for us to do a lot of collaboration, even before the start of the implementation of the ASDFT. So that is why we are quite excited that uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, the businessmen from South Africa and Ghana are participating in this thing so that we look at the collaboration forward. And then uh, in terms of preparations, you know the AFCC criteria, uh, Ghana is going to host it. We have finalized everything. Now the secretariat, the finishing and everything is ready. The residence of the Secretary General is ready. Because during the July 2019 summit in uh, Niamey, Niger, that was the agreement that it should be completed by 31st March to enable 
the full, the substantive secretariat to uh, start operation. And honestly, we were hoping to install the first secretary general in Ghana on 30th March. And uh, unfortunately, this COVID took place. But he was sworn in in the AU Commission, uh, I think the second week in March, uh, with a small gathering of people. So we are sure the moment this COVID situation improves, uh, he can now move to Ghana and then uh, start operating. Yes. yes. And uh, we want to con con uh, congratulate the first Secretary General, who is a South African, uh, His Excellency Wem Kelly Manning. And uh, Ghana is excited to work with him to ensure that he has a smooth leadership uh, to efficiently and effectively uh, look and see through the implementation of the agreement. And one thing is that we know him because he was also South Africa chief trade negotiator since 2015. And uh, we were all involved in the negotiating process. So he knows the A to Z about the technical issue, the background leading to most of the framework agreement. So we are sure with that background, we should be able to lead the process to fast track uh, the accelerating of the continental customs union. Th th thank you, Anthony, for those insights. And I think as, as I'm perhaps summarizing, I'm gonna hand on to Ijoba, perhaps we can run our second poll just wondering around how we believe this free trade agreement can impact our businesses. You'll see that just come up. But from the two speakers that I've heard from Anthony and uh, Rutendo, essentially the scale of this opportunity, I just think we need to kind of reflect on. We're talking 1.2 billion people, 54 countries, a collective GDP of $3.4 trillion, which would make us the largest trading, the eighth largest trading block in the world just after India. So within that context, how, how are you seeing the opportunities for business in Ghana, Joba, and indeed coming out of COVID, but also into this African free trade agreement era? Um, yeah, thank you, Leon. So um, before, before COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, happened, um, we had already seen that we had a huge opportunity in the pharmaceuticals industry in Ghana because uh, like Anthony said it's quite developed and um, we have a number of large-scale manufacturers that were already exporting particularly to Nigeria and other West African um, markets and they were looking forward to expanding their reach even further. We are also quite uh, young as a country in the oil and gas sector um, but however, um, we had anticipation that we would um, do more added value um, production in that sector for also the African um, markets. And um, food processing or agro, agro processing more like because there's food and then there's uh, processing for um, industrial raw materials, so things like industrial starch and salt, uh, areas where we had been developing commercial scale. And so um, those, those are still areas where we think there's huge opportunity for Ghana. Um, in terms of the infrastructure development, we are already on our way to um, completing um, the largest um, container handling port in Africa when the next phase is completed, which is our MPS Terminal 3 here in Tema, um, in, in, in Accra or in um, Ghana. Um, another sector that um, over the past few years we've also been developing is the garment and textile industry. So many, many, many years ago, we used to grow cotton in commercial quantities and um, we were spinning our own cotton, but um, that sector of the economy declined. And one of the things that uh, successive gov governments in this fourth republic in Ghana have been looking at is to revive that sector. 
So a number of private sector, large scale garment manufacturing companies came up, especially after um, Agua uh, was introduced by the US government. And it's also one of the areas in which the UK government is looking to support um, Ghana. And um, like I mentioned in my earlier remarks, since the pandemic happened, and um, we've seen our garment manufacturers step up to produce PPEs for the local market. And um, as Anthony said, it's something that we are looking to export across Africa as well. So I would say that these sectors are the key ones that we are looking to leapfrog into um, the opportunity presented by the Africa Free Trade Area. And um, whilst we look at developing others, yeah. Thanks, Ajoma. And perhaps I can invite the audience to post some questions around specific questions pertaining to this African Free Trade Agreement. We can see there that uh, our views on have we applied this uh, to, our, to our businesses. So actually, it's an opportunity that's not being seized by us, uh, I think particularly from a South African audience. And have we found any benefits? Uh, no, we haven't yet. So perhaps, Rutendo, we could perhaps with a slightly more Southern African lens, look at how we can seize these opportunities, but actually just to kind of reinforce the timelines from what Anthony has said and yourself has said in terms of how this trade agreement is going to be implement, implemented and what we see as the timelines. And while we're doing that, perhaps I can encourage the audience to pose some questions on the Q&A. Uh, if you look at your screen, there's a, there's a Q&A button. If you just click on that, you can pose a question and we can feed that into the panelists. Yeah. Thanks, Leon. And uh, I think, I mean, looking from a Southern African perspective, I mean, if, if you look at it, um, I think SADC has quite, has quite a strong, um, you know, as an economic body, it's been there for a, for a, set, for a period of time. And um, with SACU also, the, are you guys able to hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, Loud excellent. So I think what, what this has brought about, uh, Leon, is that, uh, historically, I mean, if, if you look at it before, even, even if you look at the responses with regard to the impact of the free trade agreement uh, to business in general, and I'm just referring to your poll, everybody's kind of said, look, it's not really impacted us. Uh, it, it, you know, the significance of it, we don't see it as much. But if you look at going forward in terms of what we need to do as an economy going forward, uh, or as a nation going forward, or as a region going forward, uh, in terms of developing skills, in terms of developing infrastructure, in terms of developing health systems, in terms of rebooting the economy, there is no way that can be done in, in isolation. Uh, we're going to have to look, we look at our supply chain mechanisms. We're going to have to look at the trading block and say, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? I know it goes, it's old school, by, but Michael Porter, in terms of um, the competitiveness of, of nations in the past, and says, you know, the future of nations is looking at their strengths and their abilities, and then say, how can we leverage off that? And that's the reality right now. You know, if you think about it, um, probably a month ago, two months ago, nobody would have thought one of the biggest car manufacturing companies in the world, like Ford, would invest in, put, in putting ventilators together. You've got companies that have been involved in uh, pharmaceutical, not even pharmaceuticals, um, uh, I'm looking at the um, fragrance uh, or uh, perfume industries investing in terms of uh, dispensary, dispensary or uh, hand, hand sanitizer going into, the, into that kind of industry. There's been a disruption and a diversification that is happening globally because of the need that is there. And, the same, and it was unexpected, it was unplanned for, and the same applies from an economic perspective with where South Africa is. I mean, one of the challenges that our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, is going through is saying, okay, you know, getting the economy back into place uh, based on the deficit, based on the challenges that are there, based on the energy challenges that are there, what is the best way forward? And the reality is that it's a, you have to think, there's a, there has to be a paradigm shift in the way we think, in the way we apply our resources, in the way we look at our supply chains, with our countries that support us and how we export and import. Uh, tourism, I think, has been highlighted. It's going to be significantly impacted because nobody's going to want to fly anyway. The Americans are not wanting to come to Africa. The Africans are not going to want to go to America. So that's going to be disrupted. So we're going to have a lot of people being forced 
to deal with what they have. And, uh, and the thing about Africa, you know, there's that saying is that you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your relatives. Uh, the same thing is in Africa, you've got these 55 countries that are on one country, on one piece of land. No matter how much you, we're going to have to deal with each other and say, guys, how can we make this work irrespective of borders? We are next to each other. There's people moving up and down borders. How are we going to make sure that we as a continent survive and grow and overcome this? Uh, so it's going to force us to work together, apply resources uh, financially and non-financially to take things to the next level. So I think this is a positive thing as much as it's going to be painful for the continent. And yeah. for the region. Thanks, Ritsenda. Just before I hand over to Cecilia to field some of the questions, I think uh, one of my observations of navigating business in the continent is the extreme expense of traveling from South Africa to Ghana or to Morocco or even to Egypt. And often it's cheaper to go via Dubai or Qatar or Europe, which surely is something that we need to look at in terms of pan-African travel. Because uh, it's often easier to work with a European partner than it is a fellow African partner. But Cecilia, I can see we've got some questions coming in there. Uh, we do. We've got quite a few questions that came in now. Um, I can't in the Pan-African travel. This is where it confounds me why SAA did not manage to become a giant <laughs> in this field um, and making it much more sustainable. But that's a, that's a completely separate thing uh, altogether. And I'm by no means an airline expert. Um, but I think just I'm going to go by the questions as they feed best into the theme all of it really relevant but i think just i'm um, touching on what Rutendo was saying right now um we had Sri radran pillay on while the free trade agreement is an overarching process that does still require some ratification to come into effect some will further processes that we also touched on um that are current barriers processes like taxes agreements and cooperation ability come that into effect. Um, so if we can maybe hear, I think possibly Anthony will, will be able to, to tell us a bit more about what if that process might unfold and along a timeline as well. Yeah, the question along the timelines. Uh, okay. Yes, okay, thank you. you know, just to let you know, my video is, is just giving me problems, but my, my connectivity through voice is working. So I'm just connecting, sorting out my video. My apologies, Anthony. Sorry to let you know. Thanks, Rutenda. Thanks. Yes, okay, so for the, for the timelines, I think um, normally if you start a free trade agreement like this, and the uh, you want to take off, you have to ensure that there's a smooth takeoff, you know, so that everybody is taken on board and then there's confidence in the whole process, you know. So I think that uh, in case it is pushed to January, we should be able to address all TT technical issues, you know, as well as uh, the practical implementation of the protocol on this push settlement also. And so it will make things very smooth as soon as implementation commences. Then uh, some of the questions that was asked about the free movement of persons. You know, the Africa, the African Union has also come out of an agreement on the free movement of persons and establishment. That was uh, agreed, adopted in the January 2018. And uh, incidentally, a lot of uh, the member states are signing on. So it is expected that this agreement on free movement of persons and establishment will complement the ALCFTA agreement and then to ensure that there is movement of skilled labor among others. But also to ensure that there is free movement of skilled labor. Uh, the protocol on trading services, the mode three, which is commercial presence, you know, are also key. And then we expect that when the implementation commences, uh, there will be easy for companies to set up branches in other places. And then there will be these commercial presence to actually beef up 
uh, shortage of skilled labor when uh, uh, they go to other countries to support their productivity. So all those arrangements are in place. And that is why we are proposing that uh, the other countries who have not ratified the agreement should come on board, you know, so that we all benefit together right from the scratch. On the, some of the uh, exportation of raw materials, you know, like gold and other things, I think that we should now stress on diversification or value addition of the uh, commodities which most African countries are now exporting as primary products. You see, because when you diversify or you add value, the multiply effect will create more jobs. And then like uh, with this covert, you find out that the oil prices have uh, no died. But one, there are value additions to these uh, commodities like gold, uh, like even the raw materials like cocoa and other things. The price will be stable and then it will enable our economies to perform better. And then it will also create jobs for the teaming youth in the country. So I subscribe that we should add value by adapting the accelerated industrial development agenda for Africa. And then also somebody has said in the initial stages that maybe shipping or importing goods from South Africa to DRC, the freight alone at times doesn't make it incentive. But if African countries now boost their intra-African trade through the seven clusters that were adopted, that is namely improving your uh, productive capacity, enhancing trade facilitation, uh, enhancing trade finance, enhancing trade-related infrastructure, both hard and soft ones, and then also stepping up your trade information, and then the factor market integration, we should gradually be able to harmonize, you know, things among ourselves, and it will be easier for us to trade for the betterment of Africa. Then uh, somebody also talked about the Continental Customs Union. Actually, there are various phases that we are supposed to go through. The free trade agreement is just the first stage. The expectation is that when we finish the first stage and then we finish with the second phase of the negotiation, then we will go uh, and we start the implementation. Then gradually we will hit the Continental Customs Union. Uh, so they are there, but the phases should be done properly so that there is, at the end of the day, no confusion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we can take a few more questions to see you as we're head, heading towards the end of the session. Yes. Um, um, so also, um, we've had new questions pop up, particularly about, um, you know, it's not just trade of goods, but also this is skills and people as well. So we've had a question. Um, about how will this trade agreement affect the movement of people across borders? Um, this obviously touches on the whole. Will that also be taken? Or actually, skills need will be across Africa and to also trade in skills and make that an easy and user friendly process because it's, it's not particularly easy at the moment. What do our panelists think of that? I, I think, um, Utendo, maybe you've got some views on that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think the dilemma that, that, that we face as a continent with regards to skills is that on one extent we boast as a continent that we've got uh, a burgeoning population of 1.2 billion. A, a large part of that is going to be um, a youth population which will be skilled and educated and uh, sooner or later, our population in Africa collectively will be bigger than that of, of China. 
which from a human skills perspective and from a people perspective is, is absolutely great. The challenge though is that with the, with the jobs or with the, with the future of work uh, going, to, going to the future, there's a big drive towards automation, digitization. So in other words, you've got a great population, but at the same time, you've got a, a drive in terms of automation. And if you look at it from a South Africa perspective, we're talking about mining, for example, uh, with the challenges that you have in the, um, with, with, with the trade unions, obviously uh, companies are more prone to go automation as opposed to people still that's the reality that is there. So as much as there is going to be a need for movement of skills from, continent to con from country to country in Africa, there, I think there's also an element of saying, okay, if we become more automated, if digitization is going to be the way of the future, which the pandemic has forced us to do, whereby people are thinking about, do I really have to fly to country A? Do I really have to physically go into another office block? We, I think the point I want to highlight is that the movement of skills is going to move to be more intellectual uh, across virtual borders as opposed to physical borders. And I think as a continent, that's where we have to start saying, okay, what does that mean and how do we upskill and leverage off that capability, not only to address issues from a continental perspective, but to offer skills from a global perspective. And I think, for me, I think at the end of the day, when I look at the Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, it's not to position South Africa or Africa to be the best continent in the world, but it's how can we plug in uh, into the global supply chain and be able to contribute and add value as well as benefit. Because as much as 3.4 trillion, a GDP of 3.4 trillion globally, I mean, as a continent, I think it's plus or minus 2 or 3% of global GDP. It's not huge. We're, we're a small player. But what we have and what we can offer to position ourselves with our skill set to think from a global perspective and leverage of digitization, automation, uh, artificial intelligence, that itself is going to be a game changer. And uh, so I, I think going back to your point, Cecilia, is that as much as there's going to be need of the, the movement of people uh, across borders, I think what the pandemic is, is has forced us to, to rethink and reset is that, gosh, if we're not going to be able to move, move physically between borders, how do we still move assets and capabilities and skills and knowledge and wealth across borders? And that's where the sort of intellectual capital, uh, cryptocurrency, digitization comes into play, and that's what we have to capitalize on. Yeah. Hello. And I've been okay. touching on that to um, William Callahan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And please go ahead if you'd like to add something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to talk about this uh, uh, movement of skill labor and other things. If you look at the agreement, normally for free trade agreements, uh, the concentration should have only be on goods first, followed by others. But this one, we uh, Africans uh, negotiators realized that there was a crucial need to add services to it. You know, if we want to achieve this thing, so that is why we adapted the agreement, the protocol on trading goods, and then protocol on trading services. And even in the protocol on trading services. Uh, we have identified five priority services areas that can help boost this intra-African trade. And the five priority services areas are transportation, tourism, health, finance, and then business services. You see, so these things, apart from the request and offer that has already been done to the WTO for members who are WTO. Uh, we are also going to talk about the regulatory framework so that it will smooth in things and it will make movement of skilled labor to African continent to boost intra-African trade and other things easier. So already these things have been taken in play into shape and then we expect that it will enable us to achieve our goal as soon as uh, possible. Then the other thing we have to also note is that um, we have to collaborate, you know, a lot in terms of investment. Although 
the protocol on investment is going to be the second phase. But we have to collaborate on investment to ensure that as much as possible, there is a joint venture or foreign direct investment collaboration among investors in Africa, you know, before maybe others from the continent can join in to enable us to boost productivity in Africa. You know, and I'm sure once we do all these things, then at the end of the day, uh, whatever benefits that comes from the continental free trade area will uh, duly be shared among the member states. You know, that is it, uh, my take away. Can I just add on to that, uh, Cecilia? Uh, you know, with regards to foreign direct investment, I think I was reading uh, an article uh, which highlighted that in the last year or two years, I think there have been about 43 new embassies that have been opened up in Africa by foreign countries. Um, I think the British, uh, the UK, I think probably is about 23 embassies all over Africa, not just focused obviously on political, but as well as uh, at, uh, the part of international trade. And I think that highlights something quite key that even with the challenges in Africa, uh, there's opportunity that has got a global impact um, uh, that's on this continent. And I think from an Africa free trade agreement perspective is that we must realize that once we position ourselves to be a, a strong trading block, the, the impact that we can have from a global perspective is massive if we're coordinated and positioned right. So for me, it creates and highlights the opportunity. And I gave an example of um, um, uh, the automotive sector, I know in Ghana, that, that has taken leaps and bounds. Obviously, the question is, you know, with, with the future of mobility, how can that come into play? And I know there are a lot of initiatives happening around that. But again, opportunity and opportunity, and we're positioned for that. And everybody else knows it. You just have to, uh, to ride on that wave as a continent. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that um, retained up. Touch on something, Anthony, also about the five priorities set out um, for the Africa Trade Agreement. Um, we've had some questions around specifically two. William Callahan has asked also, this kind of feeds into it, how do we ensure the quality of goods and services and who's going to be monitoring that and how are we going to ensure fairness and equity, and I'm going to whip that. Uh, one of the priority sectors was also the France. We had the says, plan shipping line for intra African cargo movements. Um, so, a few practical it was one of the priority uh, sectors. Um, Amanda made an interesting comment there saying um, that there's a, Africa sits on one of the biggest biodiversities. How can we capitalize on that and especially all trade partnership and skills like the UK and South Africa? We should be doing a lot more of these products that come into the health sector ourselves. There's a huge opportunity there. So I think just to start, um, looking at transport, what plans are in line for possible shipping lines, plans are in place to actually increase our productivity, specifically in the health sector, and who's going to be monitoring the quality of and goods once it actually gets flowing. Ajoba and um, I think we're going to have a few opinions um, and inputs around this. Yeah, so Anthony has quite a few yes, uh, some comments to responses make, to response all of that. To that yeah. mm. Yes, for the uh, quality to ensure uh, good quality for products that will be under the AFCFTA. Uh, we have uh, two main annexes under the protocol on trading groups. And then the first one is the annex on technical barriers to trade, you know, which are going to deal with standards and then the need for the various standard organizations or authorities in the member states to collaborate, you know, so that 
at the end of the day, uh, goods that are traded under this AFCFTA at least meet the minimum international standards. You know, and then uh, member states also don't necessarily use it as an impediment to block trade uh, from entering their country. Then there is also annex on uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, SPS, and they are mainly to deal with agri products, you know, that will be traded among ourselves. And uh, to be honest with you, they also realize that uh, reduce, reduction of tariffs alone is not enough to boost in traffic country because others can act uh, under the non-tariff, various non-tariff barriers. And then they will even be more expensive than the tariffs that have been liberalized. So there is also a next on non-tariff barriers. And the member states have agreed that they will also collaborate and eliminate all the non-tariff barriers that are associated with uh, importation and exportations of goods. And uh, even in the July summit last year, uh, they launched five instruments, you know, to fast track or to ensure effective implementation of this agreement. And one of them was online mon uh, monetary mechanism for non-tariff barriers. So that if uh, somebody is exporting his product to another country, whether by land or by sea or by air, and there are some impediments on the way, they can easily a uh, large complaint online. And even in the protocol on the, uh, in the annex on non-tariff barriers also, the AFCFTA secretariat is to, supposed to get a coordinator for non-tariff barriers. And then the member states are to uh, nominate focal points for non-tariff barriers so that they will see to these uh, eliminations to ensure smooth then uh, for the shipping lines, now uh, it is initially we uh, there are not quite a number of shipping lines operating along the African coast, but with the coming into place of the ALCF, is going to increase the volume of trade. So a lot of uh, private sector operators. <laughs> Thinking of floating airlines. For example, in West Africa, the West African Chambers of Commerce are planning to come out of a, a dedicated a, a shipping vessel you know, that will uh, ply along the west coast of Africa and then even the eastern coast that is from, uh, you see, from Cameroon up the way down to South Africa, you know, and we are sure that when these dedicated shipping vessels come on board, it will reduce the freight costs, you know, to boost in traffic country. Because studies that has been done indicate that normally the cost of production for most of the African goods are comparable to those in China and Asia. But the main problem is when you add a freight to it. So the expectation is that those huge quantity of goods, once we get those dedicated shipping lines, it will come on board. So we will also encourage maybe the, we know that there's what we call the Afro champions, some private sector business leaders in Africa. So we will encourage them to also look at all these scenarios and then trying to come up in the form of a consortium to ensure that we, they float some shipping vessels along the West Coast and then uh, the whole of the African continent. And then uh, that will boost productivity. So that we don't rely so much on the transnational corporations like Mexline and others 
who their main interest is uh, imports and exports from Europe, from uh, Asia to Africa. Can I just add something? Is it okay? Yes. I haven't jumped on. I sure. Know. Okay. Just on logistics, and um, just to pick up from what Anthony said, I mean, we look at South Africa, for example, we've got uh, our state-owned airlines, South African Airways, obviously, right now it's in a, it's in a review stage, and chances are, uh, I mean, there are quite serious discussions in terms of the viability of continuing with it or not uh, from, as a state-owned enterprise. Now, bear in mind that South Africa uh, is probably the second biggest economy on the African continent. Now, let's assume, worst case, I'm not a prophet of doom, let's assume that South African Airlines is literally grounded and cannot operate. Then, under the current global economic situation, uh, I don't see the U.S. airlines or the Emirates airlines, that is, the pandemic continues as it is, coming us to bail us out. But what is your problem, your strongest uh, airline that's on the continent at the moment is Ethiopia. Again, not probably the strongest economy, but you've got a, a model that works. And it makes just logical sense, assuming that worst comes to worst, that South Africa reaches out to Ethiopia and says, guys, we've got a situation, how can we partner up in terms of resolving? I'm just giving you an example in terms of how it's inevitable that uh, under the current situation for African countries to actually leverage off each other's strengths and weaknesses with regards uh, to finding a solution going forward, which helps the economies, which helps the different countries. Just a case in point I wanted to, to highlight. Back to you, Cecilia. Thanks, Rutendo. Um, yeah, yeah, some interesting. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions also about we hear a lot about opportunity and the tagline practically what will people have to do, not just what would be nice, what is a nice aim, how's it practically going to work. Um, but I think before I get to that, people really wanting to know where there might be, which is incredibly strong in Ghana. I believe Ghana's overtaken South African gold manufacturing at the moment. People want to know whether that's going to become a bigger factor um, under the Africa Free Trade Agreement. Okay, yes, it's interesting to uh, that uh, people are noticing about the increasing growth on manufacturing in Ghana uh, for some time. And it is basically because uh, from January 2017, uh, Ghana uh, foresaw the potentials, you know, in estimate under uh, the AFCFTA when the agreement is concluded. So the Ministry of Trade, the government, uh, under the Ministry of Trade came out of its 10-point industrial transformation agenda. You know, and in this agenda, some of the main features included improving the business environment. Then we have what we call one district, one factory uh, concept. You know, where each uh, district was expected to identify its raw material potential and then come out of some encouraged private sector operators to set up factories there to add value to those products. Then in the 10 point agenda, two, we have this one region, one industrial park. Then uh, we have some strategic anchor industries that we expected to promote, including the pharmaceuticals, the textiles and garment, the oil palm, the cassava processing, the salt uh, production, um, aluminum, and the, and the whole lot of them, you know. So this fortunately has started yielding fruits. And uh, if you look at Ghana, for example, statistics for intra-African trade, uh, we found out that most of our exports to the Africa 
market are in the, uh, primary industrial products. So, the industrial transformation agenda is what is making the industry grow. And then they are also part of uh, ensuring uh, that the seven clusters and the boosting in traffic and trade of trade. And we are even earmarking that these factories that are coming up, their products are not only going to be for domestic consumption, but some of them we are going to export them under the traffic and trade. So that is the potential. And we think that uh, foreign uh, investors from South Africa with their experience can collaborate with us and then uh, we can uh, still beef, uh, beef up our industrial output to feed the uh, African market so that all of us will benefit from it. Technology and then gold mining. Yes, for the technology, and the gold mining, we realize that uh, when you look at the Africa, it's mainly maybe South Africa that has the skills and then the equipment. So they can also help us to maybe add value to our uh, mineral products. But uh, we are also aware for this artificial intelligence and other things that when we finish the second phase of the negotiation for the protocol on investment, protocol on intellectual property rights and competition policy, it will encourage people to uh, get more foreign direct investors to uh, boost, beef up this artificial intelligence and uh, what have you into the process. And uh, it may also interest you to know that Though we haven't even started negotiating on the second phase, uh, people have realized the importance of e-commerce in uh, uh, current world trade. So uh, the main agreement or what the consensus we are going to maybe get is that after the second phase negotiation, there will be the third phase to take care of e-commerce. Yeah, so yes. I, I need to also add, because I noticed that Reggie from Ghana asked the question about AI and the opportunities it presents, that um, I believe that um, Google actually set up an AI center in Ghana a few years ago. It must have been like two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. So um, in terms of um, the fundamentals, I think we are poised, yeah. you know, because we are developing that kind of um, capacity. It may not be on a large scale yet, but at least it's the start. And so it also presents opportunity because it doesn't serve just Ghana, yeah. you know, at the moment. And, 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 and so it will definitely grow. Yes, there is opportunity. And I think that there was a question about um, the fact that Ghana has overtaken South Africa um, in gold mining output. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, and yeah. so I think that question was more to South Africa about how yeah. South Africa is going to address that. So perhaps we'll pass that on to uh, Rutendo. Uh, thank, thank you for dropping that. I think I, I missed it. Did you just repeat the question? Uh, is it about mining in South Africa or is it artificial yeah. intelligence? Perhaps I'll jump in, Rutendo, and you can comment. I think, uh, you know, South Africa's mining industry has you know, it was one of our most important economic sectors, but it's been in decline for some time, largely because of labor disputes and a resistance to mechanization and a resistance to the embracing of new technology. And that's where Ghana has surged ahead, particularly from a gold perspective. If we take Anglo Gold Ashanti, for example, they're now listed on the London Stock Exchange recently, having decided that South Africa is no longer sufficiently competitive. But, you know, they are a South African institution that is now thriving, you know, outside of... South Africa. But what you see more broadly for our mining sector here in Tendo, has COVID perhaps made unions more open to negotiations and being more competitive? Look, uh, you know, you know the, the challenge with any crisis is that, you know, your mindset when you're in the middle of the crisis uh, is very accommodating. And, uh, and I'm not trying to be a pessimistic. I think in South Africa, you know, 
every, you know, everybody right now, their focus is food and health. And uh, even if you hear the, your traditional trade unions, even your politics, everybody's singing Kumbaya, uh, everybody sitting around the table, everybody's cooperating, coordinating. The reality is once the storm weathers and reality goes back into check, will that uh, um, semblance of peace continue? And I think the challenge that is there is that, going back to your point, Leon, is that, um, you know, when, when, when the dust has settled, uh, the, the reality from a South African perspective is that you've still got an economic imbalance. You've still got uh, a, back, a gap between rich and poor. And that will feed into the concerns that the trade unions have been, have been highlighting in the past. Uh, I, I'm hoping, and I think we're all hoping that because of the, the shock that the economy has been given, even from a social political perspective, it will allow all stakeholders, both the government, the private sector, the trade unions, to be able to sit around and say, guys, uh, our, we've had a sort of a reboot of our economy. What is the best way forward? Uh, how do we structure and implement the structural reforms? I think that's what Tito Mboweni is obviously spearheading now, saying that we've got an opportunity now to make not only to make, but to implement the tough decisions we've had to make before as, as an econ economy taking the political leadership. So that's what my hope is, and I'm hoping that um, COVID uh, is going to be the, the wake-up call uh, that will force us to do that. Uh, the, the question is that uh, how, you know, how, how, how much of an appetite have we got in South Africa uh, in, in terms of doing this? And I think the smaller economies in Africa, it's easier. Uh, the, the big economy is going to be more of a challenge. But if we are able to use this shock in the most positive sense, I think we're positioned uh, you know, to, to, to be able to move forward in, in, a, in, a, in a healthy sense. And uh, in terms of diversification of the economy, as my colleagues in Ghana have highlighted, obviously there's been a huge dependency in terms of the mining sector. Um, I think now in terms of what has happened, the question is you know, how do we diversify and, and leverage off that uh, and go forward. Um, and so it will be interesting to see, to see that play out. But my hope is that the, the, the economy is shocked enough uh, to be able to move in the right direction and put down differences of the past and then be positive. Uh, that's my hope. Yeah, but if wishes or horses, we will be plan. I'd, I'd echo those views, Rutendo. You know, and it's, I suppose we are immigrants to South Africa. You're, I'm an Englishman, you're a Zimbabwean, and, and we come to this country and aren't always made to feel welcome in terms of how we contribute to the economy. So for me, just kind of, kind of coalescing all the discussion points we've had and started to move on towards concluding before final questions are, the African Free Trade Agreement is really an opportunity to harness all the talent we have on the continent, including, should we say, immigrant sons like myself with tenuous African links that have come back and decided to grow businesses here. And if we can keep attracting investment and offering you know, Africa as a, as a big market opportunity. We, we were talking this week as a chamber with some of our members in London who have three or four businesses that they really want to come and invest in South Africa, start employing South African people, and then expanding into the continent. I think the African Free Trade Agreement is a real opportunity to make this easier for FDI, foreign direct investment coming into the country. Interestingly, uh, you'll see the final, the final uh, poll come up now in terms of what, what do we feel in terms of confidence around the free trade agreement? Do we think we're gonna seize all the opportunities? And, and as we're answering that, perhaps I can put out a final request for questions to everybody on board. And if you'll forgive me, our colleagues in Ghana, just something with a slightly South African lens. Uh, to Thursday, we're gonna be consulted by the president uh, for Business for South Africa, who's really asking us what kind of structural reform we would like to see as business in South Africa. So we've seen this massive 500 billion rand COVID intervention fund. And as part of BUSA and Business for South Africa, we're involved in helping fundraise for the Solidarity Fund. But alongside this fundraising, we need critical structural reform. And to the point of our mining industry, how do we make it competitive? So perhaps a final ask for questions very quickly in terms of what structural reforms do we think we need to see in South Africa? And we can perhaps feed that back through our channel to the president and indeed to BUSA. Uh, and, and while that's being uh, considered, were there any other questions that have emerged to see you throughout the last 10, 15 minutes? Yes. Yes, there were. Um, I think I'm going to also just loop two in together. And this, this really also has to do with a more practical way that business can actually access um, and support 
this agreement. Question from Ross Armstrong. Channels do we as South African business actually go through to be part of the solution? And I think there's a lot of, I mean, we had a 50-50 response about people who are even aware of, of the agreement and 50% are not. So that does beg the question, where do people go? I think that no one really knows at this stage. And um, we also had an interesting question from Marlon Burgess, who's the chairman of the local medical devices manufacturing industry, saying that they have been approached by, by the World Health Organization and the African Union to support the local manufacture of COVID-related products. How can the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement plug into this and support the growth of these industries in SA and Ghana? I think this all just points again towards the practical implications. Where do business people go if they want to plug in? Yeah, I think that's one for answering. Perhaps a question for both Anthony and Ruten, though. Yes, okay. Maybe uh, just to start from the first, yes, I'm confident that this free trade uh, agreement is going to work and boost industrialization in Africa. And uh, it's because when we were negotiating the agreement, we took into consideration all the potential challenges that have prevented other free trade areas from working. That is why in this agreement we have even the protocol on procedures and settlement of dispute. You know, because once people see that the dispute settlement will be business friendly within some short time with timelines, just like the WTO, and then you cannot uh, cheat whilst protecting your market and then exporting, then people will sit and live up to expectation. So I'm sure. With the coalition of the willing now, those who are ratifying to start, and then others will come on board, uh, and the structure that have been put in place, things will work very well for the benefit of Africa. Then the second one is that, uh, for example, in Ghana, the Ministry of Trade launched what we call the Ghana technical working group on boosting in traffic country, you know, and basically, you know, the seven clusters for boosting the entire country, the trade facilitation, enhancing productive capacity, enhancing trade related infrastructure, trade finance and what have you. We have launched a technical working group and they are looking at how they can make appropriate recommendations you know, to enable us to boost in traffic and trade. And we are following up with AFCFTA export strategy, you know. So we believe that uh, these seven clusters, if South Africa can also uh, critically look at its present seven clusters in the country and then fine tune it, it will boost uh, industrialization in South Africa and then uh, it will lead into productivity and then benefit from it. But I must say that uh, to some extent also, they may have to sit down with the South African trade union because they are very powerful, but there should be a dialogue for them to see that at the end of the day, uh, you have to be proactive in looking at labor interests, this will be productivity, and then your cost of production also with your competitors. You see, other than that, you may, uh, before you realize, you may be, uh, your cost of production will be higher than your competitors and it will be very difficult for you to end up selling your products, no matter the resources that you have among other issues. Then for the COVID-19, we think that uh, even before the, implement, the start of the trading day, we should collaborate and then uh, produce essential uh, items under the COVID-19, the medicines, the PPEs, you know, which Ghana and some other countries have started producing to be self-reliant because we cannot be relying basically on production of these things from the 
continents outside Africa. So though we should give all the MSEs the incentive to produce these things and then also start exporting them among ourselves. And uh, you find out that in Ghana, for example, we have one of the university, Farm and Common University of Science and Technology, they have started producing the prototype ventilators, you know, and uh, we also have the Nubuchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research attached to University of Ghana. They are also developing appropriate vaccines and what have you. So we think that for the pharmaceuticals and PPEs, Ghana can collaborate with South Africa and then we can uh, be self-sufficient and then also uh, feed other African continents, uh, other countries in Africa. Thank you. Yeah, and I think for me, I'm also looking at your, your, your time, um, yeah. Cecilia, is that I think, you know, you know, from an economic perspective, from a structural reform perspective, you know, what South Africa has to do, uh, and I'm looking from a South Africa perspective or any of the other countries, but primarily from a South Africa perspective with regards to state-owned enterprises, with regards to, to incentives uh, for small to medium enterprises that government has to put in place, uh, but not in the isolation of the private sector. Uh, if, if these are implemented, I think what has to be done, uh, everybody knows it's in black and white. It's, it's the issue of implementing them and, um, uh, and getting all the different stakeholders realizing it's a bit of give and take. The private sector will have to, will have to give and take. The trade unions will have to give and take. Government will have to give and take. And once those are implemented, you definitely success going forward. But I think from a continental free trade agreement perspective, from an Africa perspective, we mustn't kid ourselves. It's not going to be easy. Uh, and you've got some of the, you know, but, but I strongly believe that it's going to be a combination of political, economic uh, leadership and willpower. And out of the 55 countries that are there, uh, you've probably got five or six other strong economies in the country, on the continent. And if those economies, with their political leadership, take the responsibility of spearheading and, and bringing up the weaker economies as we go on this journey, then you know, we'll see success. But leadership is going to be absolutely critical from a political and economic perspective. And if that happens, we'll see the replications of that uh, with the success of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Thank, thank you. Uh, perhaps we can share the results from the last poll as, as we just enter our concluding comments. Uh, so do we have confidence? Well, that's, that's very encouraging to see. 69% of us are confident, 4% not so, but 31% are on the fence. Uh, I think that tells us that as a collective, we're quite an optimistic bunch. And to Cecilia's point there, I think <clears throat> what we're essentially looking for is responsible, sustainable capitalism. So I think the last years have shown that the, uh, the concept of business being just to the benefit of shareholders really doesn't hold true in Africa, where we believe in Ubuntu. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the Ghanaian proverb that Rutendo shared with us earlier, I think we're, we're in this together. And business really has to serve the society in which it operates. Otherwise, we're just going to contribute to higher walls, higher fences and declining markets and increased poverty. And COVID has shown that, you know, these things largely transcend race, social class and, uh, and economic status. We're all impacted and we're all in this together. So, so for, for me, I would just really like to thank our sister chamber up in Ghana, Thank Anthony and Rutendo and, and my home team, Cecilia, Ima, uh, Leslie and Venice. But perhaps just to go around the panel and share some concluding thoughts before we, we say goodbye this morning. Perhaps our, 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 our sister chamber up in, in Ghana, you can perhaps share your observations and concluding points. Yeah, I, I, I think that this has been a very um, interesting session and um, from the interactions from the participants i believe that it was timely and to add to um what you have just said we actually have another Ghanaian proverb that i believe is also equally appropriate and it's symbolized by the broom that um if you want to go fast you go alone but if you want to go far you go together, you know. So yeah, we, we firmly believe that um, 
to ensure the sustainability of the African continent. And we should collaborate more and do business with, with each other. And as we have discussed, there's so many opportunities. Um, I, I believe that even since the end of apartheid, we've seen the impact that South Africa has had on the African economy. And, and there's so much more that we can, we can do together, particularly in the areas where Ghana is looking to scale up and where uh, South Africa has strength. You know, so um, we are looking forward at the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce to do more collaborations with the Business Chamber of Southern Africa. And we are excited about the opportunities that this presents. Yeah. And yeah, maybe nice to... briefly, uh, also to just say that uh, the mechanism for the AFCFTA have been put in place. And uh, it's up to the implementation. And uh, in the course of the implementation, as we've been highlighting, it may not be easy. You know, there are challenges. But once we have strong political will and the public and then the private sector collaborate very well, we should be able to change the face of African business for Africa, uh, economic transformation and industrialization. So that is the way forward. There's no option if we also want to be part of the international trade players. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I, I think from my side, sorry, I didn't highlight, there was a question in terms of what's the point of call in uh, South Africa with regards to the continental free trade agreement as private industry, uh, and that would be the Department of Trade and Industry, DTI. Uh, they've got quite a good and established uh, desk that is there to, to, to help people. But going back uh, to, I mean, just as a summary point, I'm, 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 I'm hugely excited for the continent in terms of being optimistic with regards to the continental free trade and, uh, and the benefits can bring. I think the pandemic is going to is going to accelerate that process. It's going to accelerate the the interdependence we've got as a continent in terms of dealing with our issues and resolving them. Uh, with the lockdowns in other countries that have been forced to deal with their own problems, it forces you to sort of clean house internally. And because of that, I think it will allow us to prioritize through leadership and good governance. It can be achieved. It won't be an easy road, but at the end of the day. The upside is there's great opportunity that can be capitalized on from a social, political, economic perspective. Thanks, Ritenda. Yeah. Anything from final points from you, Cecilia? And um, apologies to some of our attendees if we did not get to our question live, but you are welcome to get in contact with us and maybe send us any questions through or similarly if you'd like to get in contact with one, some of your fellow attendees um, please just get in touch with us and we can try and accommodate that I'm encouraged that um, after today we had 50% of people roughly who weren't really aware of free trade agreements and I can definitely admit at the beginning of this year neither was I but towards the end, we saw that almost 70% had confidence in the agreement having a good effect. So I think just the fact that we're talking about it and collaborating in this way is already a great thing. A lot of questions remain unanswered about practically how business tapped into this. But I think Anthony's also um, helped to just spell some of the mysticism and to, to, bring it, to bring to our attention that there are still some phases to go through. And we're going to get through it. And I think as this happens, um, more apparent and we will know practically where to go and how to enact this. And hopefully, I think both our chambers can help each other here with um, being conduits for this information. Um, as a somewhat sender who's sitting at the forefront of that. So that's encouraging. Um, I'll be looking up the statistics of South African imports and exports, and, and shamefully, um, African exports and imports are currently about 20% of South African imports. Only about 12% of that comes from Africa. And 
I think we can hugely improve time than now. As I was sitting here, I'm going to confess, I was snacking on some biscuits that um, <laughs> my husband actually traveled to Ghana in January and bought these back. Now, this is actually a Turkish product that he bought in Ghana and then brought home to South Africa. Now, I wonder if Turkey can get a product up there, <laughs> surely we can do better. We can do much better. So, um, I am confident that they're going to get there, but it's, it's going to take some rolling up of sleeves and all of the positive and throwing our willpower behind it. Thank you. Well, thank you to, to all our members in Ghana and in South Africa for joining us. Uh, please stay tuned for upcoming webinars. We've got quite an interesting series which we'll be communicating. Uh, thanks to Jennifer up in Ghana behind the scenes and to Ema and Mission Control and to Leslie and Venice for helping set this up. And uh, thanks again to our panelists, Ritendo, Anthony, Joba, Cecilia, for your insights and control. Wish everybody a very good day. Stay safe. We look forward to communicating after our interaction with Booster tomorrow around how we start coming out of lockdown. And Ghana, keep, keep blazing the trail and showing us the way forward.